Hey, this is Joey with Helping Others, and today we have Charlie Weisinger. He is someone I have known for quite some time. Charlie and I have known each other for, I don't know, maybe 27 years, maybe longer. Sounds about right. I'm trying to do the math. We met each other when we were like 12 or 13, so um, we have... I think it was eighth grade history class. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> And, um, and we have been on crazy adventures together and apart. And, um, he's someone that I've seen just have this really cool trajectory, go through a lot of different journeys in his life to get to where he is today. Uh, Charlie is a lawyer. He, uh, in San Antonio, Texas, I believe your focus is probate, if I'm correct. Uh, estate planning. Where, uh, Oh, sorry, estate planning and, and probate or no? Yes. Or I have that completely wrong. Oh. No, you got it. Okay. And, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and so, um, you know, I had been wanting to have him on the podcast for a long time, but especially during COVID, I thought this was like uh, a really good time to kind of um, bring Charlie on. Uh, one, because I think the field that he works in is uh, really timely right now, but I also feel like... Um, you know, uh, I've been watching him post up about some topics aside from what he does professionally uh, about COVID. And I was really uh, excited by them. And, and we kind of share some interests in advocacy for teachers and advocacy for civil rights. And so I just thought we'd probably have a good time chatting. So welcome, Charlie. Thanks, Julie. I appreciate you letting me be here. Yeah. So, um, well, one, uh, you think you could tell us a little bit about a, a little bit of your background, like kind of how you got to where you are, because, um, I guess the other thing I should share is that, you know, he has his own business. And, uh, one of the things I talk to a lot of lawyers about, cause I'm friends with a lot of lawyers is that, um, you know, it's one thing to be a lawyer. It's another thing to own your own business. Right. And, uh, a lot of people think, well, I'll become a lawyer and then I'll start my own firm. And uh, it usually brings a smile from people that have that are law lawyers and have their own firm. They're like, "All right, like we're gonna get to watch you dance," you know, because it's it's uh, there's a lot of moving parts to it. And I've gotten to watch Charlie over the years um, work in a really really cool way. So yeah, so if you could tell us just a little bit about how you know you got started in your journey to becoming a lawyer, I think that'd be really cool. Uh, you know, well, from the from the time I was a child, I always enjoyed legal shows, uh, but um, I really had no path to uh, to college or um, or especially law school. You know, in between my parents, my dad was a civil servant um, for his entire career. Um, did did a few college courses, but never finished anything. My mother did own a business; she ran a daycare center. Um, that, and I worked in that some as a kid growing up, but again, not a college student had done, had done a few college classes and stuff. So when I, when I graduated high school, I really didn't know where I was going to go or what I was going to do. Uh, started off going to SAC, you know, San Antonio, which San Antonio college here and, um, took some courses there, eventually transferred to UTSA and uh, always had an interest in the law, thought maybe I'd be a criminal justice major, um, changed my major from business to criminal justice to interdisciplinary studies to, to uh, sitting down with an advisor and saying, what do I have to do to get out of here? And figuring out I was closest to a history degree. And then, uh, and then realizing that I was uh, you know, sitting down with an advisor one time who, who said, you've got decent, you know, you've got good grades. Why don't you consider going to law school? And I thought, well, and I'd love to go to law school. I don't have a clue how to get there or what to do. And, um, and so just from that, you know, put me on that track. So I'm the first to finish, uh, to go to college in my family. Um, first to finish, you know, any, any type of degree or uh, much less an advanced degree. And so that's, that's always been very, very dear to you know. Now, as somebody that's that has done that and created a business and built it, it's very, um, you know, important to me to give back to those, you know, to those that are 
that have not gone through, you know, that, that are they're like me that have had the same type of scenario. And and I understand that I have a pretty privileged background as it is, but even, you know, that, that are, but finding people like me that haven't gone to college that don't know that path um, has been important to me. Moving yeah. Forward. yeah. And, and uh, you know, I mean, we grew up together and it, we definitely didn't grow up driving Ferraris, but we de- definitely didn't grow up, uh, necessarily poor you know dirt poor um but we grew up kind of in that fast enough cars to get ourselves in trouble yeah we had fast enough cars to get ourselves in trouble but you know we went to a school that really i think grounded us you know what i mean like if if anything we were we were kind of almost the well to do uh in our in our school that we went to and uh and there were a lot of people that were like struggling and just trying to get by and i mean I mean, I, don't, I, I, I remember us having friends that like literally lived off dirt roads, you know, over off Calabria and like, you know, had kind of this different lived reality that you and I had as we were kind of more uh, on the north, northwest side of, of, of uh, where our district lines were. Um, but, uh, but it was definitely something that like we, uh, I don't know, I felt like, I, I know you didn't take it for granted. I mean, uh, maybe I did, but but I, I know that you like you, it, you had a good work ethic that kind of came out of it. And uh, I mean, I'll never forget working on cars with your dad, you know, like taking off some headers and putting on some other stuff and getting that kind of initial kind of work in and, um, and you kind of going, you know, like you said, you had an untraditional uh, journey once, once you finished high school, you know, figuring out what you wanted to do, but like you, one of the things I noticed about you is you kept working, you know, and you kind of just kept pushing forward and, and, uh, like it, not everything may, I don't know how things went for you, but things may have not all gone perfect as you went through it. But like you, you just kept kind of pushing. And and next thing I knew, I was like, wow, this guy's like going to law school. Like this is, you're like getting out of this, uh, uh, situation where, uh, you could have just been, you know, there were a lot of other people that didn't get to have that opportunity. Like you said, we're fortunate to, to just have had that just a couple of pushes from a couple of different people. So yeah, what- no, I think so. I, I, mean, I have to, I have to give my wife a lot of credit uh, for, you know, being, being somebody there that was, that, uh, that saw some potential in me and pushed me towards um, some goals when I, you know, when I, I was going, like I said, I was going to San Antonio college. I had no idea how to, how to apply for financial aid. I just paid what I could when I went and thought no clue how to transfer to the university or, you know, to a, to a, to a, a better school. And, you know, I'm just kind of pushing, you know, pushing me in that direction. And then, you know, eventually I, you know, I've, you know, I've learned that you've just got to keep pushing forward. And uh, I've always kind of been, I've been good at uh, persevering through different things. I, I tell a, uh, this is my, to to a fault sometimes my um, we had a, 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 a situation one time at home we had a, a toilet clog in our home it needed to be and it was like we figured this out at eleven o'clock and it was what had happened is a little bitty shampoo bottle lodged fell off of the top of the cabinet in there and my wife was just like call a plumber tomorrow and I said I don't need to call a plumber I can fix this you know and so. Two o'clock in the morning, I've taken the toilet completely out and finally put it, you know, got everything out of it, put it all back together and do everything, you know, and all the while she's been telling me for hours, like, can you just stop? You're going to make a big, you know, like, we can deal with this tomorrow. I've got work. And I'm like, no, I'm going to persevere through this problem here. And, you know, and so that's kind of been my, um, I do well with, you know, I, I like to finish projects. I don't like to, I don't like to be you know, I don't like to be stuck in the middle of a project. I will push through for, for a while. That was, um, but that's, uh, that's one of, you know, one of the first times I think she realized what, you know, how I, I can be pretty stubborn on um, some things, too. but, but that's been good for me in some scenarios. Yeah. So, so what was law school like? Uh, law school was, you know, I, I hate to say this because it sounds weird, but in some ways it was fun. You know, it was a, you know, um, and I think what, what was fun about it to me is, is it was a challenge and, uh, you know, you spend, you know, 
you spend most of your semester, you don't have any tests through through classes. You know, where, where before law school, I'm used to having a test every week or a test every two weeks, you know. And law school classes, you get one test at the end of the semester, you know, at the end of the semester, and everything rides on that. And so that, you know, so it all kind of builds, and then you've got your two weeks of crazy studying for for your finals, and then and then you then you you then you wait for a month for the worst grades you've ever seen in your life. Because you know, if you made it to law school, you probably had pretty decent grades all the way through. Uh, and once you're in law school, not everybody gets good grades, you know. And so the first time you're seeing, you know, C's and D's on your college, you know, on your transcript is a was it was a tough shock to the system for, you know, the first year. And then it was beyond that. It was just you know it was, uh, you know, it was good. I'll say that studying for the bar was was a really fun activity for me. Just. Uh, getting to, you know, because it was kind of the culmination of three years of, okay, I'm going to do this. And when I finish this, I mean, as nervous as anything, and it was the hardest I've worked, but, you know, I was able to just, I know I, you know, you, I, I do really good with hard deadlines. You know, when I know I've got to get something done, I'm, I'm the type of person that my best time of day, I get more work done between three and 5 p.m. Than I do the rest of the day sometimes because I'm like, oh, it's all, the day's almost over. Got to focus now, you know. And so that's just kind of the way I've always uh, been. With I've, I was always I was a procrastinator in school too, you know. I was, you know, <laughs> um, but I've I've gotten better at not procrastinating so much in my work and helping make sure I've got things, you know. I give myself hard deadlines all the way through so projects don't fall behind like that. But but so I, so I enjoyed. The, the law school experience. I went through law school differently than a lot of people. I, uh, I at the time, my wife and I were, were raising a niece and nephew of mine. And so I had, so we had kids at home. And uh, so that meant I needed to treat law school like a full-time job. I didn't, so I got up at eight o'clock in the morning for, you know, or, or got to school at eight for the eight o'clock classes. And I stayed there till five or six, you know, where, where your class might've been from eight to 11. And then you had the rest of the day. Most people would go party for the day and then study at night. I studied during the day and went home and took care of kids at night. And uh, so I, you know, was able to treat that as, treat that a little differently. So I didn't have all of the wild, crazy law school experiences that some do, but, uh, but I enjoyed the time there. Yeah, and uh, and so how did like how how did grad school uh, not grad school law school like guide you to uh, the field of of area that you work in with estate planning? It did nothing for guiding me toward to the degree or you know to the area that I work in. I um, I took one class in law school called Wills and Estates, um, and that was a you know it was a decent class. Our professor got. Uh, got sick or his wife got really sick halfway through the class and so we switched professors in the middle of the year uh, you know and so it was completely different you know and then I took a federal income tax class and I enjoyed that but I got how I got into estate planning in general was my third year of law school I um, took a, a job clerking for a small firm and that's was his primary practice was estate planning probate and guardianship law and so I so I got to work for him, um, stayed with him after law school for about two years or so. And uh, we had, while, while I was there, he had high hopes of becoming a mega firm. And so we, we went from two attorneys to six uh, within a year. And then within the next year, I was the last one to leave uh, before. And it was just kind of, he thought he wanted to be a mega firm and realized really quickly he didn't want to do that. But what that allowed me to do was get, um, get a lot of experience in some different things. I handled a divorce case. I handled a bankruptcy case. I handled several estate planning and probate uh, matters and um, got to work with some special families with special needs kids. And I um, mean, just really, you know, got to learn several different areas of the law and found out that I really did enjoy the estate planning. So doing the wills and trusts and the planning uh, I really enjoyed working with special needs families. One of my, my favorite stories is uh, uh, worked with this woman. She was 88 years old. Um, she had she had played college basketball um, when she was younger. Back when back when girls were only allowed to play uh, 
either offense or defense. They had five girls on the offensive side and five girls on the defensive side. And so they, didn't, they weren't allowed to cross half court when they played. Um, but so she was just a really interesting story, but she had two children with special needs. Um, one was, one had Down syndrome and one um, had, had a, had a hypoxic event or something that and was, uh, and he, you know, the problem for him was he was a klepto. So every huge Spurs fan, but she couldn't, she couldn't take him anywhere anymore because if you walked into a store, everything went in his pockets or, you know, he just thought everything, thought everything was there for him. Yeah. And so, so, but at 88 years old, she realized, I don't really know what I'm supposed to, you know, she was like, I, I need to put a plan in place. I don't have a will. I don't have anything in place. And I've got these two special needs children that are in their fifties now, forties and fifties that need assistance. And so we were able to help put a plan in place to, uh, to help with that transition so, for, so that when she would pass away, her daughter, other daughter and son-in-law would step in and take care of them. And so we were able to do that. And I just saw the weight of the world lift off of this woman's shoulders uh, because we had that plan in place. And I, from that time, I thought, this is, this is all I want to do. I want to help. I want to help people not have that struggle and that stress when they, when they pass off. Yeah. It sounds like uh, maybe during that year when you were with that lawyer and, and they started ramping up and then uh, people started, you know, leaving. You said you all, you all got up to six uh, uh, lawyers that maybe you even got to kind of start embodying and having to pick up some of the slack of, of other people moving on to that perseverance that you're talking about with, the, with working with the toilet kind of kicked in and you were like, no, I'm going to see this through. I want to like kind of, and, and, and you ended up reveling in it like you ended up kind of using that as a hyper experience I is that so, wrong know, to it? you know I, I think there's there's some of that i you know i have very um much from from the beginning when i when i first started working at that firm wanted to figure out ways to help him improve his business and to to strengthen it and to, you know i was never i was never good at just being the lawyer another lawyer in the room you know in the office i I wanted to be part of, you know, the, 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 the decision making or the, the, if, if, at least the improvement of procedures and policies and, you know, and uh, I mean, when I first joined there, he didn't, we didn't do any calendar sharing. We didn't have, he had a, the, the cell, the, the office phone was a cell phone that he passed back and forth between him and the other attorney that was there, you know, and so hold, hold on here, you know, and so I, helped them get into a phone system and I helped, you know, just kind of learn, you know, kind of made myself indispensable in several different areas. And I feel like I left them in a much better place than I, than I joined. And, um, but, but then it was time for me to, you know, uh, it was time for me to start my own, my own practice after I, you know, I think kind of seeing, you know, uh, where his firm was going and where I wanted to go, they didn't match anymore. And so started my own practice. And if you had told me when I was in law school, I thought, I'll be honest, I thought I was gonna go to law school and I was going to join a DA's office somewhere and I was going to be a prosecutor. Like that was going to be my, my um, trajectory of where I, where I saw, if you asked me at the beginning of law school where I saw myself. I don't think I knew that estate planning attorneys existed. You know, like I, I knew people had wills, but I didn't really know that, you know, the, the type of lawyer that did that or anything. And so, uh, so thankfully I, I was very grateful for that experience because it showed me a new area of the law and allowed me to really jump in. And, uh, you know, I'm in awe of people that, that go to law school with a plan and come out knowing exactly where they want to go and getting there and doing it. I think that's pretty cool. Uh, that was not my story. You know, I, so I knew, I knew a couple of lawyers growing up because my parents had both been through several divorces. And so, <laughs> and so, and so you know, there, there's a local attorney in San Antonio. He still does criminal and family law. His name is Joe Stenberg. I mean, that was, he was the prototype lawyer for me. He, he was, you know, he was the smartest man I'd ever, you know, met, he wore cowboy boots with his suit. 
and you know went to court and I sat with him in court several times because he represented several of my family members through through their their nefarious deeds uh, but you know I just I, and so I mean that was kind of who I saw myself becoming to a degree you know and uh, I don't I don't wear cowboy boots with my suits anymore um, <laughs> I, I, I've joined I, I wear right now I'm wearing you know not, I'm wearing brand new house shoes that I got but uh, <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag COVID, right? <laughs> but uh, I've got, you know, so, but it's, but it's, you know, it's interesting that, you know, the people that, that influence your life over, over time. Yeah. So um, what do you think gave you the, I don't want to say gumption, but like enthusiasm or motivation to start your own firm? Like what made it just seem like a natural way or did it seem like a natural way? It's completely unnatural for me. I had no desire when I was in law school to start my own practice. I mean, and, and I'll be honest, when I started with the, that firm, I envisioned myself being there forever. I just thought, I'm going to be this guy's right-hand man, you know, for, for a long time. I'm, I'm good at that role. I never saw myself in the leadership role. Uh, but after, after working really hard there for two solid years and building what I thought was uh, plan and then watching him just overnight change his mind on um, some different things and I had no control over it. I thought well I really don't want to work that hard for somebody else again and not have the you know not have um, not have any control or say for my for my future for my destiny you know the, the, the future that I wanted and so I thought I'm not I'm not going to put out a job application and go somewhere else. I've built up a, a good enough referral source. I've got some people that will refer to me anyway, you know. And so, uh, and I had a good friend who was a CPA who had an extra who had an, an empty office in his in his building. And so I moved right in and uh, and just started. And I'll be you know I'd be lying to you if I was confident. I told you I was confident in my abilities to run a practice. I had no idea what I was doing. Uh, I was so thankful that I was sharing office with a CPA because I could, I could just stick my head out of my door and say that his name was David Plemons. Say, David, I broke the QuickBooks again. Can you help me? You know, you know, trying, trying to figure out what, um, and so that really helped me to, to grow in, in practice, having that other, um, uh, you know, having that ability there and, mm -hmm. Uh, but again, you know, from from the start, uh, within within six months in, I knew that's where I wanted to be. Uh, you know, I wanted to be the business owner and and run the firm and uh, and create a different a different type of environment. I want to create an environment where family's important. You know, so much of you know in in the world of law, you're either um, you're either the if you want to make a whole lot of money, you're working. 80 hours to 100 hours a week billing like crazy and and it's just a, a, a blitz life um, or you're destined to work out of your car out of the trunk of your car and make nothing you know for forever there's there's not a whole lot of middle ground in there somewhere and i wanted to have that type of firm that said no family comes first then business and you know and, and being in a law firm that's involved in the community and doing those things and so that's been kind of our our mission from the beginning is to to work hard to work you know to provide excellent service for our clients but also to provide you know opportunities for enriching our community and our employees yeah because uh you know most of my friends that are lawyers kind of fall into that to that era, uh, space you're talking about where um, they're working. If they're like, uh, well, like my friend Noah Speck, I don't know if you remember Nick, my friend from, from uh, uh, middle school and high school, um, you know, he got his uh, CPA or PPA at, at Texas and then got his law degree at NYU. And, um, you know, I've watched him work in the professional corporate lawyer space. I mean, it, and it's exactly like you just said. And he, he was way smarter had, than I was. Yeah. <laughs> he, well, he was but I mean, high school, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, but he has friends dropping off, you know, like through suicide. I mean, it's it's. You know, he's watching his colleagues and people that 
have been working so hard. Like you said, like this family first approach that you took on was one of the reasons like I was really excited to have you on uh, this podcast was because I saw from afar, right? Because let's not, I mean, to be, to be clear, like uh, Charlie and I have talked a couple of times that we don't talk regularly like every week or anything. And, and so from afar, it's like I saw that you kind of started putting some, some, some different values. You know, we all grow up, like you kind of said, like we want to go make a lot of money and, and, and yeah, we want to help people, but, but the minutia of it can get lost real fast. And, um, you know, when, when you're talking about realizing in those, you know, six months to a year to today, cause you're still, we're all still learning. Right. But that, that we want to do our best to kind of find that balance with family and, and our job. Um, I think it has a real impact. I think it has real meaning. I think it, it it's not, it's not a, a sales line. Does that make sense? And, and, and especially in the way I've seen you do it and especially the way I do it uh, is that we're not, we're not doing that. It's like, that's part of our sales back. He's like, yeah, we care about our family too. It's like, no, like, we really, you know, it, it really is important to us. And, uh, um, we've noticed that the quality of service we can offer and the quality of life we offer our family, like benefits by having that kind of attitude. Um, so that's why I was like really interested in asking like how you even got, got into that mindset. Um, and, you know, at least for me personally, it was because I had some of that growing up, but I didn't have all of that. Like you said, like my dad worked nonstop all day, every day. Didn't see him much. I mean, he came around every once in a while. I mean, you saw my dad like what? Every blue moon, right? But you'd be at my house all oh, the time. After we the uh, Grand Marquis. Yeah, well, I wrecked it, but yeah. Well, I, was, <laughs> I was following you, right? You know, I tell, I tell people I uh, have a hard time lying and they, um, they're like, oh, what does that even mean? I go... Well, one time I wrecked my dad's car and the police officer came up to me and said, uh, what did you just do? And I said, I was driving recklessly and stupid and put this tree in a car. And they're like, you really said that? I'm like, yeah, that's like my most uh, probably autistic moment, you know, in my life is that like, I just, I can't lie. I have a hard time lying. It's, you'll see it on my face. You'll see it's like all over me. I'm, I'm just horrible at it. And, uh, and Charlie was definitely there at that, that day where I didn't even get a ticket written. I mean, you, I don't know if you remember that. I didn't, they didn't even write me a ticket. They were just I like, remember correctly, the by officer, the way, the officer told the story about how he did the same thing to his cruiser a week or two. Before. Or yeah. And it was just kind of like, yeah, this stuff happens. We'll roll with it. And I was like, you know, it was one of the luckiest things cause I could have, you know, I could have gotten in big trouble for that. Um, but but yeah, it was, you know, um, it's one of those, those things where uh, it's like, it's not that our family didn't provide for us. It was just more like, uh, I think, for whatever reason, we feel the need to interact and be with our kids in a different way. Like, I can hear your kids in the background. I personally think it's awesome. <laughs> my kids, that's my wife, but... Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, so, okay, so when, what year was that that you, just, that you started your business? Uh, we started the firm in 2011. Oh, wow. so, yeah, we're, yeah, so we're Nine. coming up on, yeah, we're coming up on our, our 10th year. Well, can you share with the audience some lessons learned? Do you have any, uh, any advice? Um. Yeah, how much? Yeah, how much time do you have on? <laughs> Less, you know, lesson learned. Five. <laughs> one of one of the lessons that I think I, I've learned is, uh, you know, and it's, this this sounds harsh, but uh, one of the, one of the business coaches that I've worked with. Well, number one is get a business coach. If you're going to if you're going to run a business, you need coaching. You need mentors around you because there's so many so many stupid decisions that I would have made have been you know have been stopped because I worked in a I mentioned it in a peer group or with others and they're like yeah no you don't want to do that or uh, you know and, and others have and other times the other things that, that are really nice is when you come to a peer group you know I'm in a, I'm in a peer group called tab which is the alternative board uh, which with a bunch of other business owners and we have a peer group of 10 business owners and a board 
and we meet once a month and we share stories. And the other thing that's really beneficial about that is you can say, you know, I did this and it was really stupid. And they're like, oh yeah, we did that too. You know, and so it gives you that ability to say, okay, I'm not alone. And you really, you learn really fast that, that uh, whether you're a law firm or a construction company or a plumbing company or a computer technology company, we all have the same issues. You know, we're, we're all dealing with people um, and we're all people ourselves. And so you can, you know, and so, uh, you know, your hiring decisions, your, your HR, you know, problems, you know, they're, they're very similar. I'm, I'm in a, I'm in a group with, with a couple of businesses that are doing 10 to $20 million a year annually. And I'm doing, and we've got other businesses that are doing five or 600,000 a year in the same group. And we're, uh, and we realize pretty quickly that, you know, our issues are very similar. Uh, you know, that's just scale is the difference, you know, sometimes there, uh, but hiring, Hiring slow is is really important. Uh, the the full statement is hire slow, fire fast. Uh, but you know what you know it means. You know you've you've got to take your time hiring. Do you know do multiple interviews? Uh, be careful hiring people that you know already or friends. You know friends because that that uh, is a good way to end friendships sometimes. Um, but take your take your time with the hiring. And then once you realize somebody is not a good fit, you know, it, it, you've got to move on. Um, and it's, you know, it, uh, and that can feel harsh because, you know, there's never a good time of year. There's never a good time to let somebody go. You can always make a, a dozen excuses, but uh, that can really hurt the rest of, you know, if you've got somebody on your team that's not performing, that's not working hard and, you know, that's, that's really just not working it, it affects the morale of the entire team. Um, Cause you know, I, you know, it's like being back in school doing group projects. You know, we don't, you know, there's always one person in the group that does 90% of the work and everybody, and there's always one guy who doesn't do anything. And everybody's frustrated that the guy that didn't do anything got the same grade that, that you did. And it's the same thing in, in the, in the work world. You know, when you've got an office of six or seven people and one person's not pulling their weight, the other people see it, you know, and oftentimes they see it before the boss sees it. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, and that can be, that can be a challenge there. So I changed, uh, uh, I changed the whole way I teach based around what you just talked about. I do not do any group projects for a grade in school because I don't feel like the stakes are high enough and that people care. And so what I do is I do in class group projects where during that time, and not outside of class, they work on the project and they present it and it's not for a grade, it's just to show a skill that they learned through doing the project. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's the only way I've seen group work sincerely work because uh, money is not in play and you need money or, or some kind of payoff for group work to really accomplish the feat because like you said, you can't find, and, 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 it's not like you can fire someone from your group in, in school. I mean, the, the professors usually are like, no, what do you mean you want to fire them? I'm like, well, they're not doing the work, you know? I have some uh, colleagues that are, are doing like in class, like literally in class, physical class with Zoom participants, group work. And I'm like, y'all are crazy. Like, I, I, think, uh, I think you're going to drive these kids insane. Like, this is, this is the ultimate horrible, like, who's going to carry the weight of the project, you know, kind of scenario. But I don't know, maybe, uh, maybe it toughens people up, but that's a really, I, 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 all I'm saying is I really like your point on, on being uh, slow to hire. Cause I think, you know, who you pick when, you, when it's just a small business and you know, the money that you're laying out is the money. I mean, it's not just appears out of the sky. Um, yeah. You know, it's, it's the, when you've got, uh, you know, I used to follow Dave Ramsey a whole lot, and I still think he's got some really great uh, points. But one of the things that he talks about in an entree leadership course that he does is, you know, the first ten people you hire are the most. You know, the first ten are the most important because you know one one person, one bad apple there, that's ten percent of your output or your, your product. And that that you know when you when you're when you've got a hundred employees and you got one one bad apple then you know it, it uh 
it doesn't reflect as much. It does not, it's not as much, you know, you get more people to cover it. But when there's only five or six of you and one person's not pulling their way, it hurts everyone. And so, um, you know, that's, um, I, I think that's important. The other thing I'll say is being a business owner, if you've, if you've been an employee your whole life, you know, for the most part, uh, you'll, you'll find really quickly that being a business owner feels very lonely. Because as a as an employee, you're friends with everybody in the in the in the office. You know, all everybody's friends. Even the guy that's not working hard, you're you know you're still hanging. You know, <laughs> I've had those guys that you know they're not doing any work, but they're fun to be around. You know, they're laughing. You, you know, they can always bring the best jokes to the day. And so you're kind of like, yeah, I'm frustrated with you, but because I wish you were working as hard as me. But you're there when you're the the owner is you know you can have a really good relationship with your employees and i and i and i feel like i do with most of mine and uh, and have had good but it's still there's a difference there you can't you can't go to your employees with all of your struggles and stuff and so that's why having that business coach or that peer group outside is really important you know and there's there's just a difference there when you're the guy that can when you have the the power to hire and fire um, you, you know, people don't talk to you quite the same way all of the time. They, they, you know, they, they're always, they're a little bit on edge when, when they're talking to you. And so it's a, it takes a long time to build trust with, you know, with, with employees there. And stuff. Yeah. Anything else you, uh, taken away? Uh, yeah. I, I, you know, I'm sure I've got other things. I, I think just, you know, it's, uh, you've, you've got to fill roles with people who have strengths that you don't have. You know, I, I, uh, I'm a pretty organized person, but not, uh, I'm not, you know, if, when I don't have an assistant, my desk becomes a mess, you know, like I just can't keep with it. I can, when I have a, 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 you know, my desk becomes a complete mess if I don't have somebody there Kind of helping me and working through that, and so having having people on my team that are really organized are, is really important for me uh, because they help keep me organized. You know, find find out what your weaknesses are and and bring people that to, to your to the table that that complement you in those things. Don't don't just try to replace you. You know, I think one of the one of the one of the mistakes I made very early on is when I decided I'm going to hire another attorney is I tried to make that other the next attorney look just like me and and the way you know okay I you know I built the firm by going out and getting all these clients on my own and I built the firm by doing all of these things and I and so I'm going to find somebody else that can do all of those things exactly like I did and you realize pretty quickly if they could do all of those things they wouldn't be looking for the job you know, they're there, you know, find out what they're, find out what you need in the firm, what holes you need to fill and hire for that and hire for those, those, you know, complimentary struggles. Yeah, these are some good points. Uh, you know, one of the things I, I talk to people about uh, when it comes to business is just, like you said, understanding that we're not looking for people that are like us. We're looking for people that can play the different roles. So if you're a day-to-day -day person, maybe you need someone that's helping you strategize six to months out, five years out, or maybe you can find that five year out with a good mentor, like you were talking about in a group, or you have like a little board that you put together of, of advisees, you know, that is beyond your business. Um, oh, these are, these are, that's, that's really good. That's a really good point. I like that. Um, Another question I had was, you know, well, it's kind of like a two part question. When, you know, when did you start feeling like this is, this is a real bit like this, this is a business that's going to work. And, uh, and like, how did you feel when you figured that out? Like financially? Uh, you know, I, I think that, you know, in, in the business owners I've talked to, I think this is like, it, business goes like this. You're like, man, I am awesome. I am the best business owner. Everybody should be doing things just like I'm doing because I have fixed, I have found the code. And then tomorrow happens and you lose a client 
or an employee quits or something and you just, it's a nosedive. And it's like, oh my gosh, I am failing. I never should have done this. I should have kept my old job. I should go work for somebody else. I'm terrible to turn around, you know, a couple of days later, well, yeah, I figured it out again. I'm the smartest person in the world. And it's just kind of a, you know, it's kind of an up and down. I mean, in the beginning, those ups and downs are huge. <laughs> and, uh, you know, at some point along the way, the ups become a little, you know, a little more realistic. You're like, okay, well, I figured it out this week. What am I, what am I doing right? And, and then when it's not, you're like, okay, yeah, we're in a nosedive right here, but I've been here before. I know how to, I know how to get out of this. And so, um, you know, I knew, I knew fairly quickly in within, within the first year, I knew I could, I've created a business that can support me and, and my family. Um, it took me several more years to feel like I had a business that could support other people. You know, I mean, we had, um, you know, we, we've had other people come and go and that, that, stress about worrying about payroll and, and things. And, and unfortunately, you know, I'd love to tell you, well, I don't ever worry about payroll anymore. We've got great, you know, we've got bags of money lined up, but that's not true. You know, the truth is that we still have months when, you know, when we struggle and we think, okay, how are, how are we going to get through this? I mean, when COVID hit in, you know, in the middle of, um, in the middle of March, we had hired an attorney two days before, we made the decision that we were going to all work virtually from home and stop all client in-person meetings. And that was, you know, and for me that was, and I thought, and we had no idea what the economy was going to do within a couple, I mean, we had several people, you know, when the city shut down, we had several people say, I'm going to hold on to my money. I'm not doing any planning right now. So, you know, so from, from March, you know, we're growing 10% over the year before we're doing really well. April hits, and we take a nosedive, you know, and maybe do 50% of what we'd done the previous year for, for April. And we thought, okay, what's going to happen now? You know, how are we going, how are we going to keep the staff that we have? How are we going to do things there? And, and thankfully for us, business has picked back up and has kind of resumed. We're, we're a little down from the previous year, but nothing, you know, but, but, you know, nothing like what I see my friends in the restaurant business going through or the bars or you know those those things or some of the service industries i mean it's nothing like that and so so i i don't you know to answer your the question you asked was how did you know when the business was going to make it i think we uh, i think we always i don't i don't know that i know that answer yet i think i think i you know I, i'm i believe that we're going to be successful i believe that we're going to keep going but i also believe we have to continue to innovate because you know, we, you don't know when the, you know, I, I deal with a lot of nonprofits right now. We had a, we had a speaker from one of the boards that I'm on. We had a speaker from one of the, the local funders in town. I'm, uh, I believe it was the Kronkowski Foundation. They, they, they had a speaker come and, you know, and he mentioned, he said, we're, you know, you're, you know, you guys, you guys are a strong nonprofit. You guys are doing well. You're adapting. He says, but look around you know, look around the community in San Antonio and he said, I guarantee you in January, 2021, a lot of the organizations that you know are going to be gone because they're not going, because they, they don't, they're not going to be, uh, they're not adapting well. They're not understanding that the money's drying up, you know, that the, that even the, even the large, you know, multi-million dollar foundations that dole out millions of dollars a year, they don't have the money this, you know, at, at this point. Um, and they're, 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 so you've got to figure out how to adapt. And so I've kind of felt that the, the whole time we have to figure out as business owners, how to adapt. I'm on the board of another nonprofit and uh, we, we have, again, we're a strong nonprofit, but the, we haven't adapted yet. All of our, all of our fundraising opportunities are, big live in-person events where mm -hmm. you bring people together and we're having to realize that we're realizing now uh, we can't rely on that moving forward in 2021. We've got to figure out how to make, how to adapt our business. And, and thankfully we've, you know, we had our, our, our firm, we do everything in the cloud. We have, you know, a VoIP phone system. We had all of that stuff. So when I said on Friday, 
hey, everybody, we're not coming back on Monday in person. It was easy for everybody to just unplug their phone, unplug their computer, plug it in at home. And as long as they had a good internet connection at home, we were in business on Monday in a new place and working, able to work. Uh, but we're going to have to continue as businesses to adapt in this new world. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I like you mentioning the nonprofit world right now because they're having a, a big uh, challenge. And I think they've been, I mean, they've been having a challenge since 2001 when 9-11 happened was the first huge funding cuts for the arts and for outreach in general. And then when we had the, the, the recession, as they call it, no seven, that was another time. And then this time is, is bigger than both. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. And, uh, and like you said, a lot of these nonprofits, they haven't adapted. Like, you know, uh, I've worked with small nonprofits so far and, um, luckily they've been very agile. They've been, you know, there's, they're below million dollar a year kind of groups and um and so you know if you pitch them on doing subscription based donations you know where people are paying monthly you know they're willing to do an online system for that and and pay out um but i've seen with larger organizations it's a lot harder to get people to understand like the gala we need to move away from the gala like the galas it works but um we need more micro payment like we need we need payments from other people we can't just rely on these big donors push like the san antonio area foundation and and all these other uh groups like they'll give you some money but in actuality like we have to uh, figure out a way to have like the middle class like one of the things i say about san antonio is like um which i, th- I, mean, I think you would probably know is i mean 50 percent around 50 percent live at or near poverty levels right and um, our city is like uh, really in need. And so, you know, I think a lot of times in San Antonio, people think if we just had more money, we could solve these problems. And I'm like, I would rather have 100,000 people do advocacy work than get a hundred million dollars or even a billion dollars to have a corporation or a couple of nonprofits come in and do some work. Because at this point, like, it's not the money. It's like, it's us as citizens, like uh, a lot of what you all, uh, you and your wife have been posting about is like, you know, understanding your own agency and ability to, yes, uh, obviously, yes, we want the money too. Don't get me wrong. But having people uh, uh, be advocates for the spaces that they reside in, you know, whether I think y'all are in Comal uh, ISD, is that right? Yeah. And yeah. Yeah, yeah, and and all these other ISDs that are going through some of the issues that we're facing with COVID, you know, it's it's you know donating money is one thing, but advocating and speaking up and and working through these issues is another. And 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 I think that that's going to be uh, as we move forward with nonprofits, going to be a challenge for them. You know, it's going to be a challenge to to figure out how to solve a lot of the the issues that we're facing because. Um, one of the things I run up against when I talk to uh, council people and when I talk to city um, and county uh, uh, officials is that they'll bring up over and over again that we already have solutions to a lot of the issues that I'm, I'm talking about. Like, for example, the homeless, they always bring up Haven for Hope. And I'm like, I understand we have Haven for Hope and I understand you have success stories for Haven for Hope. But what if we had 10 of them? You know, what if we had multiple locations all over the city? You know, I understand we have the food bank. What if we had, you know, more locations or 460 square miles? Like the need for advocacy in San Antonio is beyond some of the spaces that like, uh, I feel like our city officials and politicians um, kind of think about sometimes. Like, I'm glad we're going to have the Hartburger uh, uh, natural bridge over at, the heartburger part that's cool cool concept but like you know there's some other things that are also you know at at risk in san antonio and so i've I've really enjoyed uh all to say i've really enjoyed watching uh like your wife i think started uh is it rev up recess i can't remember the yep rev up recess is her uh, her business that's that's focused on getting kids outside and getting kids 
uh, you know, and learning that, that how much learning is um, done by play naturally versus you know, we, we think that to learn, you have to sit at a desk and study. And we, and, and I know you know this from, from your research too, but that, that so much play, so much learning happens when you're engaged and when you're playing and there's just so much there. Yeah, no, and, and I mean, I, and, you know, one of the things I did grow up was that my mom was a two-year-old teacher and, and play-based like Montessori style uh, preschool. That's like where I went when I was a kid. And, uh, and so that's why, like with my kid, a lot of people, Oh, does he know how to do this? Can he spell? Can he? I'm like, all I know is I want my kid to be nice and friendly and be able to socially work with other people. Like whether or not he ha he can do the ABCs right now or write, uh, we'll figure that out. My wife and I both have PhDs. I think we'll be okay, you know, in terms of, <laughs> of his scholastic performance. And people always kind of look at me funny about that. But, but uh, that was one of the things that like I really, you know, I'd love to have your wife on at some point on, on, the, on, the, uh, on this podcast just because like uh, understanding play is like huge to me. I mean, that's why uh, I love to hear your kids in the background kind of running around and having a good time because it's like, to me, um, that's where you learn like that social space of how to navigate and negotiate and um, work with your feelings, like how to not become that yelling boss, right? That we kind of sometimes hear about and uh, understanding how to recognize like your agency. Like yesterday, my son was like, I was building him a, a faux Hot Wheels thing out of cardboard at my uh, uh, colleague's house because I, I COVID with him. We do a lot of barbecuing together. And, uh, and we get the, I got these cardboard boxes and I like, you know, making them this little ramp and he's just like, I'm frustrated. I can't do this. This isn't going to work. And I'm like, okay, well, uh, I'm going to keep doing this. And I, and I, and I make it work once. And he's like, huh. And he's like, um, I was like, now you notice I didn't say I'm frustrated. This doesn't work. I can't do this. And he was like, looks at me like, Hey, you're talking like I was talking. I'm like, yeah, you know, like we're, we're going to work through this, buddy. Like we're in this for the long haul. And I think, um, you know, that was one of the things that, that excited me about talking to you is that I know you all have had a very similar approach to uh, raising your kids and, um, and kind of having that perspective of not just uh, wanting to be driven by success uh, monetarily or professionally, meaning like, you know, through awards and stuff, uh, not to say that you haven't been successful in those spaces because you have. I mean, you've, you got your 40 under 40 award from San Antonio and, uh, and you, um, you know, you do all right financially. Like when you mentioned Dave Ramsey, that was another thing that I kind of like perked my ears up because like I listen to a lot of Dave Ramsey and, um, you know, I think that's a, a big part of, um, you know, this 21st century is, is that we all grew up in a debt-based society. And how do we recognize that we can, we don't have to live that way. Right. Yeah, like it's hard to get off that. It's hard to get off that wheel. You know, once you, once you're on it, um, getting into debt and, you know, we, we student loan debt is so massive, um, that you can't even, you know, you go into a hundred thousand dollars worth of debt so you can graduate and get a $40,000 a year job. Um, yeah. and it's just, you know, and it's, uh, you know, it's just a, it's a, it's a cycle that What's you, predatory. you know, it, it is, it's completely is. And so we've got to figure out. And, uh, and it's not like, and, and, and in a lot of other spaces, you go, it's predatory. And like, you know, these corporations are trying, it's like, no nope, state institutions, you know, they're all on the take. Everybody's on the take. This is all free, uh, uh, milk from the cow. You know, this is financial aid has, is literally, um, the housing market bubble like 10 times over, you know, it's in the trillions of dollars of, 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 of debt. And, uh, and I'm part of that system. So like, you know, when I'm, when I'm teaching my students, I'm telling them, I'm like, look, like, how are you? Like, I tell them essentially what you just said, which was like, you know, how much debt are you about to take on and how much money do you think you're going to make and how are you going to pay this off? Okay. So I'm not trying to scare you guys. I'm just trying to tell you, like, think about that. And then what intangibles do you need that you feel school is screwing you over on? Because they are to actually do what you want to do in life. Because we got to get those. 
And cause I'm like, I, I'm a crazy professor, right? So it's like, I, I, my classes are all project based. There's no tests, there's no quizzes. It's like, I want you to make stuff. I want you to make things that are going to uh, help you f uh, uh, find, go on this journey to figure out what it is you want to do in the communications realm. You know, so if you're, oh, well, I, you know, school is teaching me this, but I'm not really getting to do the social media stuff that's on the edge of what I want to do. I'm like, go do it. Show me how you're, you're, you're the best at it. Or uh, I don't know anything about social media, but that's what I want to do. Okay, let's start doing some. I'll facilitate. What questions do you have? Let's have some meetups. Let's keep talking, you know, and, uh, but it, but we don't have that mindset. Like you said, as an employee, right? We talk about like the different employees when you're an employee versus an employer. I think having had a small business myself now, it's like, I see that. I see it's like, you know, there's a lot of different kinds of employees and I want the students to understand like, they have agency to choose whether they're whatever employee they want to be or if they want to be the employer. And, uh, and that's something that's just not being taught. It's like they tell them, like, well, you take your English class, you take your history class, you take your government class. I'm like, I, don't get me wrong. Those classes were fun. And, like, when we can revel in them financially free, cool. But um, we also need to give them some skills so that they know what they're going to do when they graduate. Like, I'm literally proposing a – uh, a course that may sound crazy uh, for, for seniors called Senior Portfolio, where we have them make like, get this, a six month, five year plan for what they're going to do when they graduate, you know, what they're going to do for insurance, what they're going to pay in rent, how they're, where they want to live ideally, you know, what's their plan A and plan B, that kind of stuff. Because, you know, people are, are getting out of school and, and they, don't, they, don't, they don't know what to do. You know, they get this degree and they didn't have to think about any of that. They, like you said, they, they want to go party or have a good time. And uh, I, I mean, personally, I don't have a problem with that. I just, but I do want them. Well. <laughs> Girl is living the real life today. I, uh, I'm lucky in that uh, JoJo's at school today. If not, he'd be jumping in the background. My kid, whenever I'm on this thing and my kid's here, he's just, he just, <laughs> Like on the yeah, I, I, usually the door. I have a lock on the door, but apparently it wasn't closed all the way. <laughs> all good, man. So, but yeah, like yeah. You know, I'm. I'm glad we got to catch up today. Um, you know, yeah, I, I am too, Joe. I, I wanted. I wanted to say one thing. You know, yeah. I appreciate you and and your voice in in this community, uh, and and what you've done. You know, I've. I have. Uh, you know, you call yourself a centrist. Uh, I've, I've seen that, but but you are you are a voice, and uh, and it, and it's really important the, the voice that you share, and has and has been one of the things that has helped me open and, and gain my voice is knowing what you've spoken up about, whether that's you know whether that's sharing the stories of your students and and the struggles that they've gone through and the you know and recognizing social injustice there and. Um, and, and pointing out to some of us white guys, uh, you know, that, yeah, we really do have some privilege out there, you know, and it's, uh, and I think it's really important that we, that we keep his voices going and this conversation going and, and not, you know, um, I heard a, I was attending some of the, the National Lawyers Guild a virtual conference yesterday, and, I, and I'll totally butcher the quote, but it says, you know, what, not the, you know, the, the, the problems that we're facing in, in our society today, you know, by ourselves, we can't fix them, but, as, but, to, but each one of our voices is necessary and is needed and is a part of the greater thing there. And so I appreciate you being a, a positive voice in this and for giving me the opportunity to spend some time with you. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. And thank you. Um, you know, it's tough right now because, uh, this may sound conspiratorial, but then again, I do have a PhD in communication. So I'm going to roll with the statement here, but I feel like so like social media, not social media as in like this mythical thing, social media companies are literally profiteering off of this pandemic and off of this election cycle and are causing us to have rupture with each other through the algorithms, through all of the ads and pitting each other and, 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 they, we can also claim, you know, that there's some espionage going on with other uh, countries. 
But one thing I know for sure is that it's created a divide. I have friends that have gotten off of social media that just don't want because it's just too political. I have friends that yell at each other and assume the worst in each other. And like you said, it's it's uh, it's nice to see some people like that are seemingly silent most of the time. Just come in with some 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 nuggets of observations that aren't trying to push an agenda on that level, but but just more share their perspective of what they're seeing. And so, uh, and you've definitely been doing that too, and I really uh, valued it. Um, but I think it's gonna. It, I think it's something that's really hard to come by right now. I think it's really hard to come by um, people that aren't aren't scared to share uh, their opinions because um, there are real ramifications, like um, you know, like doxing, for example. If you know what doxing is, you know it's when people put out your your information online uh, for 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 when they don't agree with you you know, or something happens. Like I had a, a recent um, Facebook person that I just anecdotally knew and was Facebook friends with, you know, that got upset because uh, some, someone had assaulted her uh, by hitting her cell phone away. And, um, and so she called the cops and the cops like came and wrote a report and she was just like, the cops don't do anything. Like the cops, you know, they don't care. Um, and uh, here's, you know, here's the person that did it to me. And like, he posted a photo of this guy with his, with his kid and uh, his record and like all of his information and doxed him. And, uh, and she didn't realize like what she was doing. So all of these people contacted him and like were threatening him and telling him that he was a loser and all this stuff. And he had felony charges. I mean, it wasn't like he was this clean cut guy, you know what I'm saying? He was, he was, he definitely was a character. Um, and so then the police came back to her and were like, Hey, like who got charges to file against you? You can't just go and like release people's information and show pictures of a minor. And, you know, and she was just like really upset that the police were doing this. And, and what it really kind of showed me was just this duality of expectation that we have, you know, this, this, we're upset, we're mad, we're angry. We don't know what to do for a lot of us. Um, and what was also interesting to me for her was that she's advocating for, uh, for homeless encampments not being, uh, moved. And I was like, well, what if that guy had been homeless? You know, one, a homeless person that had just hit someone's cell phone away, you know, that was, that was next to them. Like, are you, you know, we have a, a we have a very muddy space we're in right now. You know, we've got like, to me, it's like, you got to show compassion. Like, I think it also helps that. And I, and I know you worked with, uh, you were doing like, um, you were, I remember back in the day you were like helping outfit law enforcement, uh, vehicles and EMS. If I'm, if I remember correctly, yeah, so it, I know you, it was a radio technician before law school. Yeah. 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 And so I know you've, you've talked a lot with uh, law enforcement and you know, my business partner's law enforcement, uh, for my hi-fi store. And, um, you know, it, it's hard to explain to people how gray things are. And people don't want to hear that right now. They want to hear either this person's bad or this person's good. And, uh, and, and, and so, yeah, I think that's why I call myself a centrist is because I'm like, I'm trying to say <laughs> it's so complicated people. Like I know we want to, we want to put, put groups of people into, uh, uh, different spaces, but that's just called stereotypes. And if we want to humanize each other, especially when we see each other, um, we're going to have to, we're going to have to try a little harder on our own to, to see our own faults, to see our own bad days and, and realize when it's us. Cause that's what basically what my business partner has taught me is that like, there are people having really bad days out there. And so sometimes as bad as what you're going through that day, you can kind of go like, Hey, you know what? Like, I'm upset. My blood pressure's up. I'm not happy about this, but we got to roll with this. We got to figure out how to, how to kind of chill out a little bit. So now, and, and I, and I've definitely seen how you uh, have tried to do that over time um, as well. Like I, I, with your kids, with, with your job, like uh, just, I don't know. I, I just, I've really enjoyed watching your journey. That's why I wanted to have you on here and, uh, and kind of just talk to you. But, I know I ranted a little bit at the end, but I just, um, 
I don't know. I really appreciate you coming on here. I appreciate you sharing your business experience because, um, you know, a lot of these videos, uh, while I'm not like some huge podcaster, they, they end up going to be shown either, uh, to other entrepreneurs in San Antonio, cause I'm really good friends with the people that run like uh, launch essay, which is, uh, an initiative between the lift fund and the city of San Antonio to stimulate small business with uh, tech block, which is, uh, an initiative by the city and uh, geekdom uh, to, well, I don't know if it's officially with Geekdom, but they work with Geekdom to promote, uh, the tech sector and, uh, and then tech talent, which is, uh, uh, an initiative between tech block in the city and run by this guy named Dax Moreno, who, um, he went to Marshall, uh, I believe and is our age. Yeah. So it's kind of like, uh, it's one of those things where it's real interesting. So I, so I share these videos because, um, what, what is now quote the way for us because we went through this journey it's like we can tell people hey you want to be a lawyer like listen to this video you know you'll find out there it's it's complicated but doable and um and here's one example of how how someone goes about doing it you know go find some others go get an internship like go uh do a clerkship you know figure out figure out your journey but Yeah, just thank you so much, Charlie. I really appreciate it. Well, thanks, Joe. It was good catching up with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we'll wave goodbye. All right. We'll see you you, uh, next time.